Hey friend, welcome back to the show. I am so excited to be with you today. I've, I've got a goal that I've had for years, and that is to have a conversation with Richard Foster. If you're not familiar with Richard Foster, he is a Christian writer that first wrote A Celebration of Discipline, which I ran across in the early 2000s and took to Iraq with me, actually. I read and, and went through his spiritual formation guide about uh, spiritual disciplines while I was in Iraq in the war. I think I forgot to tell him that on this interview, by the way. And apologize uh, to you right now. The lighting is really bad right now. The sunlight is coming through the windows. And I just I wanted you to see my face, though, as we talk about Richard Foster, because this writer is an incredible example of what a life pursuing Christ really looks like. And this is not a guy who goes and sits in the pews, but this is somebody who has spent his life reading and deep diving into the church fathers and what people have written about and talked about and how they formed themselves spiritually all the way back to Christ. And I was raised in a tradition where really the church formed up out of movement in the late 19th century in Kentucky and Tennessee and Pennsylvania. And the idea was that everybody had gotten it wrong for most of the last two centuries, and we needed to go back and get it right again. And these guys figured out what they thought was the real way to do Christianity. And pretty much when I was coming up, if we, we really only read or studied the Bible or books that were written by members of our group. And the idea of going back 300 years or 1,000 years or 1,500 years and reading what Martin Luther or one of the early church fathers or, God forbid, mothers like Teresa of Avila or somebody like that would have just been completely out. You, you just didn't do that. You didn't read books by people that weren't from our group because you might get the wrong idea. And Richard Foster was the first one to expose me when I read Celebration of Discipline to thoughts that went all the way back to writers who were contemporaries of the members of the very early church, the earliest Christians in the first and second centuries. And ever since then, people have been writing about how to live this life that we call ourselves pursuers of as followers of Christ. And so... I've been a big fan of Richard Foster's books. His book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, is one of the great works ever put together on prayer. And to my great excitement, several months ago, I got an email from Krista Clayton, who's a publicist at InterVarsity Press. And she said, hey, Richard Foster has a new book coming out, and we're going to schedule a few interviews. He only gives a handful of interviews now. And I got on the list somehow with this podcast. So you, my friend, get to hear today a conversation with Richard Foster and his friend Brenda Quinn. Brenda is an incredible saint who has a, a significant prayer ministry called Extraordinary Prayer, but she was one of Richard's proofreaders and idea generators, and, and they bounced this book back and forth between Richard and a handful of uh, his closest friends and colleagues for about three years before Richard was ready to put it out in book form. And the book is called Learning Humility, A Year Spent Searching for a Vanishing Virtue. Now, it might seem strange to our modern ears to think about spending a year, it turned out to be three years, looking for humility. And for somebody like Richard Foster, who is the epitome of humility, in my opinion, he's, he's sold millions and millions of books, but he's never become quote unquote famous because he's so humble and serves the local church and started a prayer ministry and has an organization that's dedicated to Christian scholarship or Novari and just is a really humble guy. So for me to see that he had published a book about learning how to be humble and that the point of it was himself learning how to be more humble, I was all in on learning more about that. So today you get to have a 35, 40 minute conversation with Richard Foster and Brenda Quinn on learning humility. I want to send a special shout out to Krista Clayton from InterVarsity Press for making this happen. I am so honored to get to be one of the handful of interviewers and podcasters that got to have Richard on the show and in, in support of this book. And friend, I can't encourage you highly enough to go read Richard Foster and start with learning humility because I think in many ways it ties all of his other books together. There's another sort of uh, coincidence 
this about me and Richard Foster. We've never met in the flesh, but Kathy Helmers is my agent and his agent for years, and she's actually co-written a book with him before. So i um, excited to bring this episode, Kathy. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope we did honor to you in getting together two of your old clients, Richard, much farther along in his journey with you than I am. But just so grateful uh, to be connected to Richard now and InterVarsity Press. And friend, I just I know this episode is going to bless you. I asked Richard to pray for us before we got started, and you'll hear that at the very start of the episode. And then at the end, I asked him, to, or he decided to pray again. And it's this incredible Quaker prayer of we talked about the other day, the palms down, palms up, learning to empty yourself of things you can't control and, and open yourself up to things that Christ can give you. And it's just extraordinary. So enjoy this conversation about learning humility. And just remember, friend, you can't change your life, even about something as simple as trying to learn how to be more humble until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you'd like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. My friend, we're back, and I'm so excited to be here with my two new friends, Brenda Quinn and Richard Foster, here with us on the show today. Welcome, Brenda and Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really good to be with you, Richard. I've been reading your books for most of my adult life, and it's been a long goal of mine as a podcaster to have you on the show. And so here we are, and I'm really grateful that both of you are here with us today. You are so kind to have us, and we love that you do all of the technical work. We just <laughs> sit here and talk. <laughs> That's right. Richard, before we get started, would you mind saying a word of prayer for us? Yes, Lord. We come here before you, the three of us, but also all who are listening, those especially who have gone through difficult times, and even some who dealt with tragic situations. May your spirit move among us that words that are spoken or thoughts that are given might reach into the heart for the good of every single person listening to this conversation. We pray it in the good and the strong name of Jesus Christ, our ever-living Savior, teacher, Lord, and friend. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We could talk all day long about all the books that Richard Foster has written. But I think if you look at them zoomed out a little bit, I think they lead to the new book, really. I was listening this morning on the treadmill. I went back and opened up prayer. And you were talking about how humility helps us learn how to pray way back then. So the new book is Learning Humility, A Year of Searching for a Vanishing Virtue. And maybe the two of you, just for a moment, give us a little bit of 30,000 foot view of where this book came from and how it came together. Uh -huh. Brenda, do you want to start? Or? I got to go along on this journey with Richard as he wrote. I got to be part of a small writing team as he wrote chapter by chapter. He sent a chapter to us at a time and we got to read it, think about it, comment on it, wow. send back some notes to Richard. And so that was my role just for about three years. It, it was about a three-year process that he took writing the book. And it was great to be along on the journey and just giving him some feedback. Wow. 
And the idea actually emerged unexpectedly. It was a New Year's Eve, and I was thinking a little bit about New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I'm not good with those. They last about a week and a half for <laughs> most. And But as I was just, just thinking about it, I felt addressed with just two words, learn humility. And I thought, oh my, I, that's addressed to me, that I should learn this. And initially, I just began, someone had given me a one of those little blank books to write in as journal. And so I began to just simply jot notes and thoughts about learn humility. And because I was doing it in a journal form, I don't know, I just didn't want to use the Latin Gregorian calendar, January, February, March. And so I looked up some of the Native American calendars, my own background in part is Ojibwa, but I looked at the Lakota calendar and really liked that. So that became a kind of framework for my thinking. And initially, I was I would jot things up and down the margins and around, and, but that be, that's how it began. And And I thought, if I'm going to use the Lakota calendar, I should learn a little bit about Lakota history and culture. And so that kind of framed how the book began. And I asked Brenda and several others to read along with me because I didn't know if this is something that should go beyond just my own personal notes because there was some sense in which it was almost a stream of consciousness. (laughs) I'm just writing Mm -hmm. or having some experience or studying something historically. And Brenda was so helpful in her responses to give me some sense of uh, how this should work. So that's how it started. Wow. So it really started with you journaling in response to this, the Holy Spirit directing you to learn more about humility. Yes. That's remarkable. That's right. Learn Uh humility, just those two words. And I took that seriously and took a little bit about humility. And Brenda said it actually took us about three years. Now, I condensed all of that into a one-year rhythm so that readers can kind of follow with me on that. This is that moment I was afraid of. I'm going to have to let the dogs out real quick. I'll be right back. Fine. (laughs) So, Richard, I have your water bottle. Your black water bottle. Thank you so much. How did that happen? Well, I I I was, yeah, I was cleaning up the sanctuary late Saturday night and found it with your name on the bottom. Yes, indeed. Okay. When the time comes, I'll pick it up. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for retrieving it. We live on 300 acres, about 40 yards from the south bank of the North Platte River. And we are in the middle of the central flyway for probably a hundred species of birds and geese. And our dogs will allow 10,000 cranes on the yard. But if one Robin lands on the deck, they have to go get it. And that's what just happened. We got to go kill that Robin. (laughs) What state are you in? Nebraska. Oh, wow. It's it's amazing. I lived lived in Nebraska once. You did? Oh, when I was just a kid, Kearney and Hastings, Nebraska. Yeah. North Platte is 100 miles from Kearney. It's not. It's Indeed, a, I know where it is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and so if you ever want to see Sandhill Cranes, that's right. You ever want to see oh Sandhill Cranes, oh. they nest on our property for about six weeks in the spring, <laughs> 10,000 of them. It's something. I was just praying with someone from Omaha this morning who's in Omaha, and she, we were praying for rain for Nebraska, because I guess you guys are having drought this summer, it's, and we're having the exact opposite here. It's been very dry. Yeah, it really has. So the, the, the farmers need rain desperately, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so speaking of prayer, getting back to it, you started, Richard, at the start of your consideration of writing, you, you wrote this bit about having coffee, and you came to this little prayer, purify my heart, renew my mind, 
sanctify my imagination and enlarge my soul to unpack that right. for a second. Cause that's a perfect prayer almost. Actually, that's a prayer of formation, the spiritual formation of the inner life that might grow more deeply into Christ's likeness. Yes. So it begins with the heart. I cannot program my own heart. I can't program anybody else's heart. And so that's where we depend upon God. And so we ask, Lord, purify my heart. Now, that uh, we can stay with that for quite a while because God may come and say, now here's a corner of your heart that needs to be touched. And so that can lead to confession or whatever. But the purification of the heart, and now first we pray, cleanse my heart, see, make me ever new. And then we come to the purification of the heart, that is a forming of the life, of the deep motivations before God. And then God begins to work. We open our heart for that. Yes. And then that the mind, transform my mind, purify my heart, transform my mind. What we think on is so deeply important. Yes. In all of life. Yes. I know Brenda, who works with people constantly at her church, is working with people who need formation of the mind. And then in our imagination, our thinking is often done in images. So the imagination needs to be purify my mind, uh, my, my heart, form my mind. How does it go? Transform my imagination. Sanctify. Sanctify, sanctify my yeah. imagination. Sanctify. There's the word. That's sanctify my imagination and then enlarge my soul. That is wow. the inner workings of the life. Enlarge to go beyond what I often call our circle of nearness. You know, I can care about people in my family, but my circle of near, nearness must increase, my soul open to others around the world. Mm, wow. That's such an important sort of beginning point for any sort of formation that we would yes. like to ask the Lord for. That's a good word. It is the beginning point, and then that will lead us into all kinds of things. You can take a while with a prayer like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Three years, maybe, or longer. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, when I first started reading the book, it's one of those, you're one of those writers, my friend Philip Yancey, that when you release a book, I'm just going to read it because you've earned that sort of credibility. So I was like, I started reading the book and I'm like, how is he going to tie this Lakota calendar and learning humility together? Okay. How's he going to pull this off? And you did it. So just talk for a minute about that. Like, how that process came about. And Brenda, as a reader and co-writer here, oh, like how did that yeah, back Brenda, and forth go? Brenda, you talk about that because, yeah, that was, I didn't know how it was going to come together. <laughs> I think, haven't you called it the divine accident, Richard? Um, uh -huh. But it's, I just think it's amazing how Richard started exploring some of the Native American traditions and first chose the Lakota to look into. And as he did, he found not only so many things about the culture that, that fit so well, but of all things, that humility was their, the first virtue that they write about, that they value. And it yeah. very clearly in their writing comes above all the other virtues. It comes first. It's the foundation of all the other virtues and how fitting that was. And I don't think Richard even knew that before he started exploring which kind of a calendar he could use. And Lo and behold, here humility is such such a foundational part of their culture, and yeah. then all of the other virtues build on it, and so it just fits so well with the themes of the book. And that parallels so well with our Bible, with Scripture, how Jesus was the divine paradigm for us for life, mm -hmm. and that humility was so foundational to who Jesus was and became 
a way, the basis for understanding or entering into all of the other virtues. We need that kind of teachableness that humility brings before anything else can happen. So that fits so lovely. I was surprised myself. It's such a cultural moment too right now. And I think, friend, if you're listening to this right now, this isn't, it may seem we're talking about people who are older and these big ideas about humility and spiritual formation and all that in the culture right now says so much about be proud of who you are, fight for your rights and demand that everybody notice and pay attention to you. But Richard, what does the word say about that? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Like, grace you know, to the humble. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. So why mm-hmm. is humility important to a younger listener right now? Why is this so important? Yes. That verse that you quoted, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and in due season, he will lift you up so that we can get off this everlasting need to be the most important person in life. (laughs) What a freedom it is to say, I don't have to be the center of attention about everything. And that's why it's important, especially for the young person coming up, to see that there is a way of living. Now it does, I know, it stands in contradistinction to the narcissism of our culture that says, I'm it. You remember the story of Narcissus who looked in a pool of water and saw his face and thought, oh my, I'm the most important, the most beautiful, I'm everything. (laughs) When we come, Jesus is everything. And when we come to see that, we can be put in our proper place. Remember, humility comes from humus, the earth. We're just, it puts us in a right relationship. And what that does is it frees us to value other people for the precious people they are. And we don't have to be constantly trying to make people look at us or think we're important or the center. We learn, here's what we learn. We learn to resign as the CEO of the universe. That's what humility does for us. That's a heavy burden for someone to try to carry. If I was going to be the CEO of the universe, I would be really stressed out because I'm not very good at being the CEO of my own life. That's exactly right. And here's the thing, and then I want Brenda to comment. Here's the thing. Humility is so practical. How can I learn to live with my children, with my spouse, with the neighbor, in a way that values each one? And a humility frees us up to take a deep interest in another human being. Wow. And I think you were really on to something, Lee, when you said, I can't even be the CEO of my own life. And I think another thing that humility does for us is it it removes that burden from us of feeling like we have to direct our lives and we have to make a life for ourselves. And we're, we have we get that message from our culture that we have to make our own life and guide our way and charge our way through to make something of ourselves and have an impact in this world. And save all these people and do all these things. And I think humility puts us back in the place of where to keep our eyes on Jesus. And then he'll guide us. We we need to be obedient to him, not to the messages of our world and the images that our world tells us we need to be. When that's where that burden is taken from us. And when he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. That's where we find that rest. Amen. Yes. And then, so speaking to that for a moment, both of you, like this, the big 
cultural move right now is justice, right? Everybody's concerned about justice for this group or that group or this individual or that individual. But I had a guest on this show recently, Derwin Gray, who's a former NFL player, now a pastor. And he said, justice without Jesus is just vengeance. Mm. You have to get Jesus involved. And so how does humility and justice work together and what does it mean for us as individuals when we look at something like what happened to the Lakota people, for example, what's our responsibility to get involved in justice and how does it relate to humility? It starts by being concerned about the marginalized persons, those who are off the radar screen. Yes. Remember the old song, The Sat Upon ratted on, we learn to care about those. And that can come very simply. We think of a child and to value a child. That's why so often when there was discussions and debates among the disciples about who was the greatest, Jesus would bring a little child and say, now watch this see how children can be with each other without needing to strut or make, you know, any of that stuff. They're in the sandbox all playing together, and it doesn't matter who's who. And that's what we want. That's where it begins. Now, it moves beyond that. We look for the poor, the oppressed, the broken, the bruised, and those who can give voice for them or to give platform for them, or to alleviate the need. See, humility allows us to care about the needs and the concerns of ordinary people. And that's why it's so important in justice work. Wow. Brenda? And I think it allows us to, humility is so connected to love. And I don't know we could, that we can really love if we're not If we're not humble, if we're not in the image of Jesus, if we're not acting as Jesus acted, and it was in his humility that he was able to love the world and that he was able to give himself for the world, for the people that he loved, that he created. And so I, like you said, I, it becomes vengeance when there's not love and humility connected to this justice. That's right. Think 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 about, go ahead. Think of what Paul says in first Corinthians 13. Just listen. Love is patient. Think of that. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or, listen to this, rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. You see how humility fits in that? It's so central to love. It's not arrogant. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It's not rude. Boy, oh boy, we can sure learn from that, can't we, in our day? I think of Micah when somebody said, what does God want? And Micah 6, 8, he says, he's showing you what he wants. He wants you to love, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly. So they're just inextricably tied, right? They're just inextricably tied together. And I've said it to my children as they were growing up. I said, that means when it's up to you, you perform the thing that is just. You do it right. And when it's done to you, you love mercy. You remember that you've been forgiven of much and you need to be merciful to others. And then all the time you need to be humble to frame everything in humility. And I think that would that kind of ties into, you, yeah. you quoted Bonhoeffer when he talked about how God draws near to the lonely. And you, you really made a good point there with Bonhoeffer's work. Yep, good teaching. Yeah. 
So how in your book, prayer, Richard, you talked about how humility teaches us how to pray and so expound on that for a minute. Cause I think that's, it's hard for a lot of us in this day and age, especially with as busy as much noise as we have and internet and social media, we, it's hard to learn how to pray these days and to stay it is, in a prayerful posture. I met the very first church that I pastored, there was a fellow, dear guy, but prayer was hard for him. He was just a worker. And so I began meeting with him every week. And we would talk a little bit about what he cared about, what was on his mind. And then we would pray, but without words, just silently. And finally, after doing that for some weeks, I said to him, now, John, I want you, I think you're ready to break the sound barrier. <laughs> Let's use words. And I want you to know that these words, thank you, is a good prayer. And <laughs> so we were quiet for a minute, and then he began to pray, and it like this dam broke. And see, he had this he he had this sense that I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, and all of those things that we go through as human beings. But when he saw that God was drawing near and was more than happy, just like a little child can never draw a bad picture, a child of God cannot utter a bad prayer, because God says, that's my child who's chosen to be with me. It's a good prayer. I'll make it an even better prayer. <laughs> but anyway, when John did that, when he finished praying, he actually jumped up and got a hold of me. He was a big man, lifted me up. And he says, I did it. I did it. <laughs> so that was so much wow. fun watching him learn to pray. And humility was such a deep part of that because he learned to come with open hands, and to just thank God, and then ask whatever seemed important to him. That's how we learn to pray. That's One of the old writers said, pray as you can, not as you can't. <laughs> so many people, they come wanting to pray as they can't. They want to use big words or something. <laughs> no, we just come with whatever's on our heart. Wow. And if we just say thank you, we're at the beginning stages of prayer. Thank you, Lord. That's right. Brenda, I noticed your Zoom account is called Prayer. What's that all about? It's actually Extraordinary Prayer. I just, extraordinary yeah, I just changed prayer. my name on there. Yeah, I was just thinking about that as Richard was talking. We have some groups in our church. They're called Extraordinary Prayer, and it's not any sense that ordinary prayer isn't good. Ordinary prayer is wonderful, but we, in our groups that we call extraordinary prayer, we actually take pieces of scripture and pray into them. And it's not the prayer groups where we're necessarily praying for the different prayer requests of that day and the physical issues and that, those kinds of things, although we do pray for those, but we pray into scripture. And this morning, we I had an early morning prayer group today. We were praying out of Psalm 18. And I, I love praying the Psalms. I love praying all of scripture, but the Psalms, if anyone prayed like a child, it was David, right? Because he was just completely honest. He, what was on his heart is what he poured into his prayers and he didn't hold anything back from God. And he went from one moment praising God and loving him and trusting him in the next moment, asking God, what are you doing? When are you going to help me? Why, why are these awful people pursuing me? And will you please strike them dead? He Strive. prayed everything. And that's how it was in this part of the psalm that we did this morning. We just did the first 15 verses because it's 50. Psalm 18 is 50 verses. But he starts out with, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. But sometimes we don't have words for our prayers. We can't pray because we're so filled with emotion. That's but right. we can come to God's word and we can pray the words that we find in scripture, we can pray David's words and we can use those words as our own. And there's such power in that. And then I love in this Psalm, he goes into this whole vision of God where he's talking about the cords of death entangled me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me, the cords of the grave coiled around 
around me. The snares of death confronted me. And he just goes on and on. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice. And then he goes into how the earth is trembling and smoke is rising from his nostrils and God is parting the heavens. And the darkness is a canopy around him and it just goes on and on. And we were all reflecting on that after we read those 15 verses about what an image that is of God's power and really what an image that is of what's happening probably in the spiritual realms, right? Yeah. That that there's there are realities going on in the spiritual realms that are outside of what we can see, but sometimes God gives us little glimpses and he seems to have given David a glimpse of that. And what a beautiful thing to realize God's power as we see a vision like that of this amazing things happening that are that feel so overwhelming and big and dark and God is supreme over all of them and God is in authority over all of it and what a reminder in our world today as we struggle and in our own personal lives as we're grieving as we're crying out to God that he is able to handle all of it and he's in control amen yeah you've written about that in celebration of discipline what you just mentioned Brenda this mode of reading scripture where we put ourselves into the story and, and try to feel the things that were going on. And I like the example you gave. Look at when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, for example, and he's telling them all the things you thought about the Messiah were wrong and all the stuff that happened. How would we feel if he was telling us that? And put yourself in the story and then flip it around. How would Jesus feel if nobody's listening to him and everybody's rejecting him? And like that, that mode of scriptural storytelling inside yourself leads to a different kind of praying. Yeah. I was thinking as Brenda was talking, there's a group of the Psalms that are often called the Lament Psalms, yeah. and those are prayers of anguish, and learning to pray our heartache, our anguish, our hurt, our brokenness even, and those who are listening, you may have that, and go to the Lament Psalms, and it will teach you how in that kind of, as Brenda said, that honesty before God. And see, that comes by humility. We say, I'm not in charge of all of this, and I need I need the strength and the help that comes from prayer. And if, I, if we learn to pray our anguish, we will grow in the grace of God. God waits to come to us until we open the door. <laughs> That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, and friend, if you're listening and you've been through these massive hard things, when you lose your son, you know, when, mm -hmm. when your child is killed, like you you realize pretty quickly that your only hope really is that God really is who he says he is because you're not yeah. in control of that. You can't fix it. You can't make it feel better than it does. And the only hope is that God can somehow lift you out of that furnace. Isaiah talked about the furnace of suffering. He says, see, I've refined you. Not as silver is refined, but I've refined you in this furnace of suffering. And I realize I'm in the furnace, but it doesn't feel like I'm being refined. It feels like I'm being burned up. And so God needs to keep that <laughs> promise to me. He needs to somehow mold something out of me in this that's going to be good, or I don't know how to have hope anymore. The first verse that I ever learned as a brand new Christian, a teenager, was First Peter 1.7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, <laughs> yep. might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We deal with that. And if you haven't dealt with the trial of your faith, you will. Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> We And we learn how God walks us through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Boy, oh boy. So that's what we, that's what we trust in, is the Lord who is our shepherd. Wow. I promised you both about 30 minutes. We're coming close to 40 here. So I want to respect your time, but it's been, it's just been a remarkable walk through the virtue of humility. The new book 
from Richard Foster is learning humility. And it's, it really sits among your other great works as a peer and maybe in some ways your best work. And I love the fact that you narrated the audiobook yourself. It's beautifully done. But uh-huh. just as we, as we wrap up here, talk for a second, if you will, Richard, my, my new book is Hope is the First Dose. And it's all about how to find hope again after something tragic happens in your life. And I think it's important to, to, parse out what, in your opinion, both of you, what's the difference between hope and faith and how are they related and how are they different? Because I think it's important to have a difference, understand the difference. Faith is the grounding of our lives. And out of faith, we can hope for the future, for God to work in our lives in new and in living ways. And so, Hope grows out of faith before God. Brenda, maybe you have some thoughts. Yeah, I've just, as we've been talking, I've been thinking about how James talks about going through trials, the book of James, and how one of the big things he focuses on is how our trials develop perseverance in us. And when when we're seeking to live a life of faith, we really can't live a life of faith without growing in perseverance because there are always going to be things coming at us that make our faith hard. It, make, it, it makes it hard to hold on to our faith and to hold on to God. Um, but as we develop, James says, as, as we develop, this perseverance brings character and character brings hope. And hope yeah. does not point us. And Which I have point. seen that. I think we've all of us who have been walking with God for s- some period of time have seen as he's developed perseverance in us and we've stuck with him and we've gotten through the various trials that we've had, we see perseverance becoming real in our lives. And we do see Mm -hmm. that over time, it does lead to hope. And we can cling to that hope and we can feel, sense that hope welling up within us because our God Mm -hmm. is faithful. And we've seen that over time as we've held to him. Amen. It's like being able to see light at the end of the tunnel and believing that it's not a train. (laughs) God's light at the end of the tunnel. Watch for that. Amen. One last thing I want to ask of you is I recently shared with the listener, so it'll be fresh on their minds, a prayer approach that I learned from you. I think you learned from the Quaker heritage of this palms down, palms up idea where you're holding on to some things that you can't control. And you need to learn how to give them to God. And then you're empty of some things that you need to be armed for the journey that you're trying to undertake. So maybe just unpack that idea for a moment and give us a tool for prayer and a a different type of prayer. Why don't we, you who are listening now, we put just a simple palms down. That is, let go of whatever is pressing upon you. Palms down. You say palms down. And then when you're ready, you can turn your palms up to receive from the Lord the strength to live for today, the hope that things can be new and different, that God can provide a way where there is no way. Palms up. And then we thank the Lord for doing good in our lives, in whatever we face. May it be. Amen. Amen. Brenda Quinn, Richard Foster, pleasure to meet you both. Richard, I feel like I've known you for many years because I've learned so much from you, and I'm grateful for the time of both of you and putting this book together. Lisa and I are going to give away two copies of Richard Foster's new book. Uh, First, two listeners to write in to lee at drleewarren.com. Please include your mailing address, and we're going to send two copies of this book out because I think it's going to change your life. Richard Foster, Brenda Quinn, thank you so much. God bless you both. Thank you. Great to be here. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Lee. Very good. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. 
Bluepill.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery. Dr. Lee Warren. Substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarnmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker. Grace provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them. tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.